Hey, and welcome to today's Bible study. We are taking a non-Christian approach to the Bible, and today we are looking at the Garden of Eden. Now, we've done this study before, Two Gardens and a Snake, but this is a expanded and revised version of that, and I think you're going to like it. We're going to be here for quite some time today, uh, maybe as long as two hours. And the reason for that is this is a very intense reframing of a very well-known story. And we want to present a lot of information because a lot of people can have a lot of different questions as, as they start to, to unravel this. Uh, they're going to go, oh, wait a minute, what about this and what about that? And so we want to create a, uh, a platform that has a lot of information that you can share with other people. Um, in a nutshell, the Garden of Eden story has been turned on its head by Rome. I'm not a fond. I'm not fond of Rome and their their cult, Roman Universalism, which is the the mother of Christianity. Um, I gave my life to the Lord when I was 11 years old. Uh, I've served the Lord all my life in ministry, and uh, up until probably about uh, five years ago, and I guess now I'm back in ministry again with all of this work. And my passion is to know Jesus and to teach Yeshua to people. Same person, Yeshua, Jesus. I just use them interchangeably so people know what I'm talking about, though my preference is Yeshua HaMashiach, uh, which is Yeshua, the Messiah. And um, But in understanding Yeshua and spending a lifetime and continuing to uh, learning the text, uh, I've started to see some things. First of all, it was about five and a half years ago where... Um, my understanding of the text grew to the point where I no longer could be a Christian. Now, I didn't leave the Lord at all in any way, shape, or form. But I came to the realization that the Christian story, the Christian narrative that we are told, simply actually was not supported in the Bible. And so I left Christianity behind and began a search with my two questions. Who are we? What is the universe? And... Then some years ago, I started finding more information. I started looking a lot into archaeology, and I started finding some things. Some I started connecting some dots that uh, it appears no one else has connected before. Um, although we are going to look at one of the early church fathers near the end of the study, uh, who did see a lot of what we're going to present here today. Uh, not perhaps in this the story of the Garden of Eden, but definitely in the identification of some of the people or players characters in the Garden of Eden story, and that's going to be important. He's considered a heretic by Rome, but uh, uh, he was definitely uh, on the money, so to speak. So so we're going to uh, look at the Garden of Eden story. We're going to look at the characters in the Garden of Eden story, and um, and then we're going to kind of you know discuss, well, what, what does that mean? So let's just, uh, we've got a whole lot of mind maps we're going to go through. If you've ever been to one of my studies you know we use mind maps like crazy so if i just zoom all the way out here each one of these little tags here you see is actually a massive mind map um, there's a lot of them and oh i can delete that one because we don't need that one anymore um, so we're going to expand all these as we go but let's just start here with the title mind map and um, we can see kind of what we're going to go through here we're going to start off with um, how belief works. This is really important because we're going to present information that is going to absolutely contradict what you quote unquote know to be true. Okay? What you believe. And uh, we need to be aware of the way our mind works when we're confronted with new information. We need to be the observer of our thoughts, not just the wash in our thoughts. And we're going to look at the two gardens. And this is really the story that has been left out of Christianity, but it's the story in the whole Bible, um, we're going to touch on context. We're going to look at the, the fruit of the tree of life that we find in this Garden of Eden throughout the ancient world. We're going to talk about Yahweh. Um, then we're going to go through the story a little more in depth. So we've, we've scripted the whole thing out. Um, and then we're going to ask, you know, what really happened in the Garden of Eden? We're going to identify Yahweh and the snake. And then we're going to talk about one of these early church fathers, just briefly, Marshon. Now, this isn't Marshonism. Um, as a couple of people have accused me of. Um, actually, the only reason I learned about Marshawn was from somebody criticizing my work. Uh, he, I, I was meant to get a screenshot of his, his chat conversation. He, he, he messaged me on Messenger. He's a very famous American 
Christian apologist. He has a, a weekly radio show. And he said he was going to uh, expose me on his, his radio show. And I pointed him to my website and said, well, you, you might want to go and, and look at my website before you do that. And sent him to my website, andersondiscoveries.com. And I never heard from him again, and he didn't mention me on his radio show. Why? Well, this has now happened to a few uh, Bible students, Bible scholars. And the reason is because when you start to actually look at this information, this is how really this talk, Two Gardens and a Snake, originally came about. Excuse me. Um, I'm just going to... I stayed up all night doing this, so I'm a little tired. I I had a nap before we came on. Um, So don't mind me if I have some coffee while we're we're starting out here. There'll be plenty of time for pauses for you to think about things. But um, two people now have actually said, you're following the heresy of Marcion. Well, who called Marcion, one of the earliest church fathers, who called Marcion a heretic? The Church of Rome did. Well, I don't have any respect for the Church of Rome, so I don't care what they have to say about him, actually. And actually, it's kind of the reverse for me. If if Rome or Roman Universalism, Roman Catholicism, is going to call somebody a heretic, well, I'm probably far more inclined to actually listen to what that person has to say because Roman Universalism is the heresy. So we're going to go through this, and it's going to be a wild ride. Um, let me say to Christians, first of all, There's going to be information here that is going to grate you in the beginning. I ask you, please, push through. If you don't know me, well, you will find out when we, you know, everyone says my face lights up when we start talking about Yeshua, and yes, it does, because I can't help it, because I'm madly and crazily in love with our Lord Yeshua. So there are things that you're going to hear, though, at first, that are going to sound blasphemous and insane. And you're going to want to switch it off. And I just ask you, please, when we get to the end, things will start to make far more sense. And you'll see that everything I do, and I mean everything that I do, is lifting up Yeshua. Okay? Everything. (laughs) My whole life is about lifting up Yeshua. End of story. Now, to non-Christians, let me say this. Um, The way that the Bible has been characterized over time um, is is that it's a, a load of nonsense and it's just been written by men. And, well, it was written by men. Well, except well, <laughs> except some parts of it were not written by a human. But, but anyway, we'll get to that. And I, I, I don't mean they were written by a spiritual God, but we'll, we'll get to that later on. Um, but actually, when, when you start to see some of these things uh, that connect throughout ancient history and the way that the Bible has all of these... Uh, undiscovered messages that I'm discovering and now talking about, like this very story we're going to go through today, uh, you're going to realize, wait a minute, (laughs) Christians don't even talk about this and it's in their Bible. Isn't that odd? Isn't that strange? Um, And you're going to start to realize that there's something to this. (laughs) There is. And so, um, you know, Christians consider the Bible the word of God like a holy relic. I don't. Um, um, But I read it a whole lot more than they do, (laughs) which is kind of funny and ironic. But if, if, you're an, if you're not a Christian, fantastic, because this is not a Christian Bible study. But these are ancient texts, right? The Bible is 66 books, and actually some of them are comprised of multiple fragments of ancient texts, like Genesis is at least three parts, um, and more than 40 different authors. And we say more than 40 because there's at least 40. But as I said, Genesis has three different authors, right? Verse 1 and verse 2 of Genesis is one fragment of text. And then the rest and and so forth. So and we'll talk a little bit about that um, in today's study. So it's not one book, it's a multitude, it's a library of books, and they've been passed down to us, and there's a whole bunch of other ones out there that aren't part of the canon of uh, Christian scripture that are also really good and profitable to read, like the Book of Enoch and the Epic of Gilgamesh and lots of other ancient tablets and things that we've found, but we talk about those in other talks. We're not going to talk th- about them so much today. All right, so let's get started. What we're going to get started with is how belief works. And this is really, really important, right? So first of all, when we're talking about belief in this context, we're not talking about faith, hope, and trust. All right? So we're not talking about believing in your spouse, your appearance, your children, etc. 
or believing in yourself, you know, I'm, I'm going to accomplish something. That's not what we're talking about. So believing in Yeshua is having faith, hope, and trust in him and his promises. That's not the kind of belief we're talking about. We're talking about when you construct an idea in your head and you latch onto it and you say, I believe in this, right? And that's what we're talking about here. So what we want to do is we want to think kind of like this. We just want to have free thought. You have a thought here, you have a thought here, you might consolidate some thoughts into, into a little pile over here, or these are all based around the laws of physics, and these are based around religion, whatever. Um, but what you don't want to do is start attaching yourself to these thoughts. You just want them to be out there, and you just want to observe them and consider them, right? But then this is what we do. This is the tendency, is that we, we start to accept our thoughts as abject reality or truth. We say, I believe this. A decision to accept thought as truth has been made. This is where it gets really dangerous. So this is what we do. We, we collect all these thoughts together, and then we start saying, well, I believe in this, and I believe in that, right? Then we go a step further, and we, we, we get the addition of beliefs that others have, but you've never even considered yourself. Right? So we say, well, such and such is like the Christians believe such and such, so so do I. Right? So you start adopting the beliefs of other people, even though you've never even thought or contemplated those things before. You just kind of go to somebody and go, well, what do we believe about this? Oh, let me tell you what we believe. Oh, okay, great. And then you can go to the person and say, well, we believe this. Okay, that's not very helpful, is it? Because you're just borrowing somebody else's preconceived notion of reality and, and then projecting it. Um, and, and people, whether they're religious or non-religious, tend to do this all the time. But it gets even worse. What happens is we, we end up personifying belief. So we have this identification with belief. So we, we move from I believe this to I am this. I am a such and such. I am a Mormon. I am a Christian, a Catholic. I am a non-Christian, all these different beliefs that we've constructed in our head, and then we, we become the belief. We like put it on like a garment. We say, I am this belief. Well, now we've, we've entered into uh, a phase where what we believe, what we've decided, that's all it is, a decision in our mind, what we've decided is true is who we are. Oh dear, and now you've lost your, your true self. Now you've lost your identity, right? And so um, we do the same thing. We take the addition of beliefs that others have, but you've not even considered. You say, well, I'm a such and such, so I believe such and such. Probably of things you've never even give, given a moment's contemplation of. This is highly dangerous. And so these things create identity attachments, and it be becomes the formation of our ego. And it, it is basically like being a lie. Now, I don't have something for the F on the end of belief, but, but uh, it's unfortunate, isn't it? I laughed as I was putting this together too. Um, but that's what it's like. It's like being a lie. Because belief is simply a decision you've made inside of your head to go, well, I accept this as being abject reality, as being true. Really? How do you know? Have you actually contemplated? Have you considered it? Have you observed these, these thought processes in your mind? And so that's what we need to do. We need to recognize the way thought works, right? So a little experiment here. A simple way to recognize each thought. Stop. Take note of your next thought and just look at it without judgment. All right? And we're going to do that right now. We're going to take a few seconds to pause. And I'm just going to block the camera off for a second. We're actually about 20 seconds, maybe maybe 15 seconds. And we're just going to be still. And don't be distracted by the things around you. Try to stay focused here with me. Try to stay present. And I want you to just wait for your next thought to come along. Okay? Ready? Three, two, one. And so right about now, you should have a thought coming along. Now, I just want you to notice that thought for a moment. Just look at it. 
probably about something we're just talking about. And what I want you to do is that I want you to judge the thought, whether it's right or wrong. I just want you to observe the thought and just look at it and go, well, well, isn't that interesting? That's what I want you to do with this whole thing today. I don't want you to see what's going to happen is all throughout this talk, there's going to be this mental conflict taking place. And as we explore brand new information today, your mind is going to enter into a state of conflict. And so be aware of what your mind is doing. Don't allow your current belief constructs to classify everything as true or false. Right? So, why? Because you don't want your preconceived beliefs to simply make up your mind for everything, okay? Rather, you just want to say, well, isn't that interesting? There's going to be a lot of interesting things today. All right? Um, already many Bible scholars, students of the text, have looked at these things. So far, no one has been able to, to debunk these new discoveries in the biblical text. And that's really important. So, the people that generally get... Um, kind of passionate about trying to debunk this what we're about to present here are, are new believers people that don't really know the bible they know christianity um but they don't know the text and um and that's unfortunate but the people that do know the text and i've got a lot of them that are friends and uh they've looked at this for me um over many months and um <laughs> not a single one has been able to come back and say i think you're wrong <laughs> No, it looks like we're right. Um, so let's start off with the story, the two gardens. This is the main story of the Bible that you've never heard before. And we're going to read some text here just to kind of set the, the, uh, the story. Okay? So it's peculiar that the story that brackets the entire human condition in the biblical text is completely unknown to the vast majority of Christians. How is that even possible? How is the story that provides context to everything else, never preached in any church, never published in any of the thousands of new Christian books released every year, hardly mentioned at all in nearly 2,000 years of theological discourse? Chances are excellent You've never heard anything I'm about to show you, unless you've watched some of these teachings before. <laughs> and it's vital that you consider that deeply. If one of the single most important contexts of humanity that exists plainly in the biblical text is not spoken of, you must ask yourself why. Why has one of the single most important stories been all but erased? And the answer is simple. If this story was known, as it's going to be now, the identity of the snake in the garden changes. And that changes everything. Roman Universalism or Christianity. And now, now, now some people, I think I actually mentioned this, but just in case I, I don't. Um, some people say, well, I'm not a Catholic, though. I'm a Christian. Yes, I understand. Except that 99% of everything Christianity teaches you, that everything Christianity believes, is exactly identical and comes from Roman Universalism. There's really very little difference. You could say, well, we don't venerate Mary. We don't believe in transubstantiation. We, we never had indulgences we kind of do as tithing. Um, you know, but you could well, we don't have a pope, right? Um, so there's certainly a few differences, but 99% is the same. The idea of God, the interpretation of God, the, uh, the way that you look at like the Garden of Eden story we're looking at today, it's a hundred percent identical. So here's the story, right? Oh, um, so Roman universalism calls this event, the fall of man or the original sin. And you'll probably find that's the title in your Bible. Right in Genesis chapter 3, it probably starts off with the fall or the fall of man or original sin or something along those lines. Right? So, according to Christianity, the story goes like this Adam and Eve lived in a garden with God. 
Satan, as a snake, comes along and tempts Eve to eat fruit from a tree God had specifically told them not to eat from. Eve eats the fruit, committing the first sin against God, leading to the introduction of death and the fall of mankind into a sinful state. All right? I don't think anyone would, would have an argument with that. We're going to dissect this story and in the process discover that the text simply doesn't say what Roman Universalism or Christianity claims it says at all, and that actually the story is quite different and incredibly more powerful than you've ever been told. Right? So you need to think for yourself. Your pastor will tell you that everything I'm saying here is wrong. Well, you need to, you need to demand. <laughs> um, you need to very politely request, okay, uh, would you just watch the video though? <laughs> Um, and if you were invited by one of your parishioners to watch this and you're watching it now, thank you. Um, and I welcome your feedback. Um, so show it to them and ask them to resolve the theological dilemma because near the end we will present uh, the theological dilemma. And if you think that what I'm presenting is wrong, then you're going to have to solve the theological dilemma before you can really debunk what I'm saying here. Um, and it's quite startling. It's throwing, throwing a lot of people for a loop. Um, so be ready for some very inventive responses. Roman universalism has done everything it can to conceal the truth from us, even turning Yeshua into Satan. Now, we're doing this a little bit differently than the way I presented it before, and I've, we're kind of going over it a few times in greater depth each time. And so some of you will pick it up along the way. You'll get enough clues. You'll go, oh, wait a minute. Is he trying to say, probably? <laughs> Right, and that's good. I don't mind that at all. So uh, we're trying to build up to something that way. Uh, otherwise, it it just takes too long to finally get to the end conclusion. So we're going to kind of reach some serious clues, and then we'll go back and we'll we'll look at look at it in more detail. And then you go, holy cow, it becomes undeniable. The story that brackets every other story in the Bible. In the beginning, we have God in the garden with Adam and Eve. But what many Christians have never been told or noticed is that the entire story of the Bible is about restoration back to a garden, right? The story starts in a garden. It ends in a garden. We start in a garden. We end up back in a garden. What's so special about the garden? What's in the garden? Well, the garden grows trees. Very, very special trees. And one of these trees is the tree of life. The entire story of humankind is about our access to the fruit of the tree of life. And that, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're done. <laughs> I mean, that should be the story. That should be the story. People go to church all their lives for 80 years. I never hear this very simple story. Wait, we start in a garden? Oh yeah, the Garden of Eden. What do you mean we end in a garden? Well, you don't know? Uh, no. What are you talking about? We'll get to it. And, and that's the thing, why you need to ask why. Why have you never heard this before? Now, some of you will hear, would have heard a little bit. Some of you that are more students of the text will go, oh yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know this, yes. And th this is not it, though. This is not, we've got a lot more to show you today. But, but in general... If you go to a church for your entire life, you'll never hear this story talked about in your church. Why? It's the story. You say, well, Yeshua dying on a cross, coming back to life, coming back. And, oh, yes, that's absolutely important. It's right up there. But this is the story. This is what it's all about. This is why Yeshua died on the cross. This is why he's coming back. Those are just the middle parts of the story. But the story is that mankind started in a garden and is going to finally be restored back to the garden. And that is the story. I cannot stress it enough. It is the story. And 99.9999% of churches will never even utter it. Why? Why is that? The beginning and the end. So let's go through the story. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. 
and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then we have the incident with the snake. Adam and Eve eat the fruit they were told not to eat from. God curses the snake, Adam and Eve. Now they are outside the garden, deprived of the fruit of the tree of life, and mankind dies. That's the beginning. That's where it all starts. And you say, oh, I'm very familiar with that part. Yes, you are, but most people aren't familiar with this part. Revelation 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. We are back in the garden. We have access to the fruit of the tree of life. Mankind has immortality again. Relationship with God is restored. And as we read in Acts 3.21, this is the restoration of all things. Interesting. So the focus here is what? Mankind's access to the fruit of the tree of life and immortality. So this is incredible. This is the story that brackets every other story. It should be the central message of Christianity, but instead it's ignored. But there is so much more to this story. And there's a reason You've never been told this all the rest of the story. Buckle your seatbelts. Because <laughs> Kansas is going bye bye. All right. So, big mind maps and much more to come. And you will get all of these mind maps. All right. They'll be available at the end of the study. So, let's move on now to the importance of context. The way we approach the text is really, really, really important. Context. In semiotics, linguistics, sociology, and anthropology, context refers to those objects or entities which surround a focal event. In these disciplines, typically a communicative event of some kind, context is a frame that surrounds the event and provides resources for its appropriate interpretation. In other words, correct interpretation. It is thus a relative concept, only definable with respect to some focal event within a frame, not independently of that frame. And I didn't make up these definitions. This is from the Wikipedia. So I call this the pursuit of understanding, right? Contrasted with textualism. Now, right now, you're actually hearing a little bit about context and textualism, or contextualism and textualism, because of right now here, September 27, 2020, um, yesterday, President Donald Trump announced his Supreme Court nominee, and she is a woman. Her name is Amy Coney Barrett. Now, she's very much a textualist not a contextualist of the Constitution. Well, you, you can decide when we start to explore this, well, is that a good or a bad thing? But a lot of people, a lot of constitutional scholars right now, are, in fact, even conservative constitutional scholars, are very concerned with Donald Trump's pick because she's not a contextualist. She's a textualist. And the difference is quite severe. 
What is a textualist? Well, textualism is a formalist theory in which the interpretation of the law is primarily based on the ordinary meaning of the legal text, where no consideration is given to non-textual sources such as intention of the law when passed, the problem it was intended to remedy, or significant questions regarding the justice or rectitude of the law. And I call that the pursuit of legalism. So you can kind of understand, like, wait, oh, if this lady who's being um, nominated to the Supreme Court sees the Constitution um, by looking at the modern-day understanding of the words, I'm just turning my fan down here, um, that's not as good as someone who's a contextualist who's considering what the founders' intent when they wrote the Constitution, actually was, right? Um, textualism distorts the original meaning by sticking to currently known definitions of the individual words used. We must seek out the original context if we are to faithfully understand what the author is actually saying. Now, if you are someone like me, I'm not an American, but I'm, I'm a strict constitutionalist, Besides, I want to know what the founders were meaning when they wrote the words in the Constitution, especially as the definition, the meaning of words shifts over time, right? So I want to know what a word meant back in 1776, not in 2020, because that's rather irrelevant. I need to know what it meant to them who wrote the document rather than what it would mean to a person reading the document today that had no knowledge of the original definition of the word, right? Important. So, in other words, I, I see the Constitution as a document that doesn't change, but when you look at it from a textualist point of view, it can change because the definitions of the words can change over time. The intent, those intent on deception become rigorous textualists because it provides the easiest and most convincing method of deception. If they can convince you a word means something specific, they will argue you must adhere to that definition, and most people just agree. But Yeshua directly addressed this practice. He said here in John 5, my favorite book in the Bible, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And this is what they would do. The Pharisees, the scribes, they were radical textualists. They were arguing over the letter of the law. That's where the term comes from. So you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. This is what the religious leaders of his day were doing. Today, Christians are doing precisely what Yeshua warned the Pharisees against, right? So beware of Bible teachers that are textualists, not contextualists. Now, some contextualist Bible teachers have received a bad rap in recent days, uh, recent years. Um, I won't name any, but um, some have been called out by textualists because of their contextualist point of view of the text. So I argue that what Rome has done is reframe the entire biblical story and called their version of events Roman Universalism, better known today as Christianity. Protestantism is no different. They agree on 99% of all foundational doctrines. What I am trying to do is pull back from a legalistic reading of the text to see the big picture by re-examining everything we have been taught by Rome and reading the text without 2,000 years of added metaphor. Additionally, to look at not just the Bible alone, but all possible ancient clues that could provide context to understanding the biblical texts. The importance of removing metaphor. Yeshua used plenty of metaphor in the text, and that's fine. But it's not fine for Roman universalism or Christianity to start adding their own metaphor to the text to reframe and often completely alter the meaning of important passages, often to their complete opposite. When I approach the text, 
I seek to peel away the Roman Universalist metaphors and read the text plainly as it is written as much as possible. This can be hard, even for me, for a Christian to do, because these metaphors are so deeply ingrained in the way we understand the text today. You've gone to church, you read a portion of the text, and then the person explaining it says, well, it says this, now let me tell you what that means. (laughs) And sometimes what they're telling you it means seems to be the complete opposite of what the text is just simply saying. And we're going to encounter some of those examples today. But adding metaphor is adding potential for error. Removal of that added metaphor necessarily reduces the potential for error. It doesn't mean we're removing all error, but it does mean we're removing more of the potential for error. That is what I seek to do. Reduce error by returning to a plain reading of the text. All right? So, let's explore some context. (laughs) And now it's going to start to get a little more exciting. So we've got some of the the boring, uh, you know, logistics out of the way, and now we start digging in. By the way, this is going to be going up on our on the podcast feed, which you can find by going to israelanderson.com. So if you're listening on the podcast, awesome. Good to see you here. All right, so let's zoom out. We're going to look at the tree of life through the ancient world. Now, remember, we just go back here and we look at this whole whole incident here with Adam and Eve. So they were in here. They had the tree of life. and Then here in the end, we're given back the tree of life in Revelation 22, right? So we know that this tree of life is really super important. What if we could find that tree of life throughout the ancient world? Well, we can. Let's take a look. So let's start off with this image here. Sorry for those on the podcast, but uh, this is an image of um, the Sumerian gods. And on the left here, we have a god called Enlil Nunamnir. And on the right, we have a god called Enki-Ia. And the symbol at the top there is their father, and his name is Anu. And he's always featured in this winged disc, and we see this winged disc throughout multiple uh, civilizations and cultures around the world from different epochs of time. Um, we talk about these guys a lot in other talks. We're not going to spend as much time today talking about them because we have a lot to get through. But here you see them standing in front of some kind of a plant. And you see that the guy is behind them, directly behind them, uh, holding something up. Looks like a pine cone in their hand, and they're also holding these bags. But this tree, we can find this imagery of these gods and this tree and these handbags all around the world. So here's the larger picture of, of that same one here. And uh, so you can see the four of them here. But here's um, an Arcadian image. And you see the same thing. Different culture nearby, but different culture. You can see here they've, they've got eagles' heads uh, because they fly not physically fly, but they have their craft. But what, what is interesting is that we start to find this all over the place. So uh, we've just got a few examples here, because otherwise you'd be here all day. But here is in India, in Hinduism. Here we have one of the Hindu gods sitting down at the foot of the tree, and you can just see the tree there in the background. And you notice that the fruit on that tree are also pine cone-shaped fruit. And if you notice in the tree, there are two handbags. The one on the left is fairly intact. The one on the right has been smashed on the bottom. And then we have another example of that here, another another, um, Hindu god, again sitting at um, the tree of life and up in the tree you can see carved in even more elaborate 3D detail these handbags. Right? What are the handbags for? Well, I solved this kind of archaeological mystery long before I knew it was one. (laughs) Uh, And uh, 
the if you search for handbags of the gods online, you'll find memes, you know, saying, well, what, what's in the bag? Um, everyone's trying to figure out what on earth is with these handbags. It's very simple. It's just that people haven't taken the biblical text seriously enough to start connecting the dots. And when I did that, then it all starts to make sense. This is the same tree of life that is being talked about with Adam and Eve in the garden. And, um, and these handbags are iconic across multiple different cultures and civilizations. We've got a bunch of examples here, we'll see. So, fruit and handbags. So here we've got a close-up of one of these Sumerian gods, and in great detail. And there's three things that really stand out here. There's the, the fruit in the hand that, again, looks like a pine cone. Um, they've got a wristwatch, which appears to be the flower from the same plant and signifies them as gods. And then they've got this, um, this bucket in their hand. And we've got some, some good views of, of this bucket here too. We see it all across different cultures. Sorry for those on the podcast that can't see the pretty pictures. Now let's uh, take a look at just some of those handbags. This is the one that nailed it for me. I, I thought I had it, and then I found this, and I went, I do have it. And so here's uh, a stone carving of one of the handbags of the gods. And I was looking for a clue that would, you know, surely this handbag simply has the fruit of the tree of life in it. I mean, it's such a logical and obvious intuitive thing. And then I saw this and went, oh, well, here we go. We've got the same flowers that are on their wrists. And we have, they're not eyes, they're the cross section of seeds. So here's an ancient culture. Um, now, you don't need a microscope to see the cross section of a seed, of course. Um, but here you have engraved onto this uh, piece of stone um, these cross sections of seeds and the flowers. So these handbags carried the fruit of the tree of life. Here is Koitsukotl, the feathered serpent from South America. And you can see him here, he's supposedly in his craft, in his flying craft. But you can see here he's holding the handbag of the gods. And here's another one. And again, you can see he's holding the handbag of the gods. And we find it here in Asia. Here's East Indonesia. And on this pillar here, uh, we find that there's actually two of them. There's a very small example here at the top left, and then a much larger example here, bottom right. And you see when they're carved really well. Now, this is old and it's been well eroded by, by, the, by time and the weather and, and all. But you can see here that the hinge system on, on this kind of bucket. It's quite obvious, right? As we, we take a closer look at some of these, you'll see here, uh, this hinge mechanism is quite simple, right? It's a looped piece of, of something, um, I'm, maybe metal. Um, and we see it here as well, right? This one looks like it might be wrapped in leather or something. It looks like it's got a tassel of some sort here. Now this is granite, this particular one we're looking at here. Some of the others are softer stones, but this is granite. You, the, the, the ability to carve an intricate detail in relief like this, right? They're not, they're not carving an image into the stone. They're, they're taking away everything out that is not the image to leave behind a relief, right? This is kind of the opposite way that we do today because this is extremely technical. This is done by some kind of a very high tech machine. You can see underneath the fingers that this machine has gone in and carved out the stone from underneath the fingers. The level of detail here is extraordinary and it's lasted for many thousands of years. And uh, this is by far not the best example that we have of engraved stone. Here we have one of the oldest examples um, of a god. Again, carrying the fruit in his hand and the handbag in the other. Here is yet another example. Um, and here you see the symbol across the top, the winged disc, the disc in the middle with wings, signifying the father of these guys, which means we know, unless this image has been flipped, um, then we would know that because he's on the right-hand side, that this here is the god called Enki Ia in the Sumerian. Okay. And we have another example here and another example here. 
So we find these all across the ancient world. Here's a really good close-up detail. And you can see here that's such a crystal clear design of this very simple little hinge on the bag. Um, now here's one of the most interesting ones. This is probably the oldest example in the world of the handbags of the gods. This is on one of the pillars at Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. You see the three handbags across the top. And it's very unfortunate. There's a lot of story, a lot I could tell you about this, but they stopped excavation upon finding this pillar because they know some of the things. I'm not the only person that knows these things that I'm sharing with you today. I'm just the only one in the world talking about it. I am absolutely persuaded that there are other people in positions of extreme power and influence that know so much about what I'm sharing with you today that they would laugh at how little I know. Um, this has been concealed from us. So this is Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. This is very close to the exact precise location that the biblical text gives us for the Garden of Eden. Is it the Garden of Eden? Most likely it is. Can't be 100% sure, but most likely it is. Okay? Now, wouldn't it be amazing <laughs> if we had an actual one of these bags in our possession? An actual bag? Like a real, a real one? <laughs> Imagine that. Well, in a museum in Sweden, J.J. Ainsworth found this, and she took some photos of it. Is this an actual, real, legitimate handbag of the gods? I don't know. It's possible. But if it's not, it's absolutely a replica of one, and there's no doubt about that, because this gold band that runs around the top of it, <laughs> you can see the enlargement there. It's the same gods standing at the same tree with the same fruit in their hands, and the same handbag in their hands. So I'm looking forward to getting over there and getting photos and maybe getting permission to, to physically handle it. But uh, whether it's a replica or whether it's the real thing or not, it's still quite profound. So throughout the ancient world, we have all this evidence that has survived through the ages of time and tells us about the fruit of the tree of life that the gods alone had access to and would selectively, from stories that we found throughout, throughout antiquity, would give it to humans to prolong their lives. Interesting. And it's all through history. It's just, we could, like, this is just a tiny, tiny, tiny little scattering of images. And there's so many more from cultures all over the world. But the central players are these ones here at the top. These three are the people that we're going to learn more and more about. And you should go through the work at andersondiscoveries.com. Read the page that's there. Answer the question. Even if you already know the answer to the question, because in some talks we tell you. Um, doesn't matter. Work it out for yourself. Oh, by the way, you notice they have dreadlocks. <laughs> Isn't that cool? So dreadlocks did not come from Africa. Uh, they came from the gods. And uh, so here again, we have Anu at the top, and you'll always see this represented as the winged disc. And then you have Enlil Nunamnir on the left, and you have Enki Ia on the right. The one on the left is, uh, Enlil means Lord of the Air, uh, and the one on the right, Enki, means Lord of the Water. So, and according to what we find throughout ancient history, these two guys have been the key players amongst the gods that have built human civilization all around the world. All right, but you don't need to believe any of this. Remember, you just want to look at it and go, well, isn't that interesting? Yes, it is interesting. So let's move on. Now we're going to go back to the Garden of Eden story but we're going to look at it a little more in depth this time. And so to do that, we're going to look at the introduction of Yahweh to the biblical text. The word God or Lord in the Bible 
is translated from several different words, mainly Elohim and Yahweh. In this study, we're going to use the transliteration of the actual Hebrew word that has been translated as God in the Garden of Eden story. That word is Yahweh. Transliteration means the English-sounding equivalent of the original word in the Hebrew. So let's start off with this one, Elohim. This is the word we will find in uh, Genesis 1.26, for example, where it says, in the beginning, um, God cre- created... Sorry, that's Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, but um, uh, Genesis 1.26 says, Then God said, Let us create man in our image, in our likeness. And we go into that in far more depth than other talks, so we won't today. But this is the word in Hebrew you can see here. And it's used in Genesis from 1.1 1, 1 through 2.3. That's up until... Chapter 2, verse 3. And it can be translated as God or gods. And Elohim is actually plural and most times ought to be translated as the gods. We translate it as God most of the time solely due to the Christian narrative of a monotheistic God being such a strong influence over translation choices. In Psalm 82, There is a good example of Elohim being translated both as God and gods in the same sentence. And here we have it here, Psalm 82 verse 1. God, Elohim, has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods, Elohim. He holds judgment. Okay? And that's a very interesting passage. We've talked a lot about Psalm 82 in the the past. So it can also be translated as Lord. So that's Elohim. And then from Genesis 2.4, we have the introduction of a new word, Yahweh, also known as the Tetragrammaton. And that can be translated as God, Yahweh, and we will be using the actual Hebrew word for Yahweh instead of calling him God, as we just explained. I guess I can just get rid of that because I already said that, didn't I? Um, Or Jehovah. Now, there was no J sound uh, back then. J sound is fairly modern introduction into uh, language so it would have been more Jehovah but anyway the King James kind of set the precedent for a big mistake in calling uh, Yahweh Jehovah but that's kind of stuck around nothing I can do about that so as we go through the story of the Garden of Eden we're going to use uh, these correct words right we're going to use the word Yahweh because that's who it talks about that's the word it uses okay So let's look at this now. We're going to go through the garden story in five acts, um, four four acts in Genesis and the fifth act from Revelation. And we're just going to walk through the whole story. Now here is where I'm going to try not to give away too much, but I want you to pay close attention and see if you can start to see how the story that's in the text and everything here is verbatim from the text. Not not tricking anybody here. Everything here is just a copy and paste from the Bible. So as we go through the story, try to find where, uh, how this is different from what you may have thought the text actually said. All right? So let's start here. Act 1, Yahweh, says to Adam, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must never eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Okay, So there's a question here. Why does Yahweh not want Adam and Eve to have self-awareness, the ability to see and recognize good and evil? So that's Act 1. And then along comes the snake. And the snake says to the woman, Did Yahweh really say, You must never eat the fruit of any tree in the garden? And so Eve answers the snake and says, We're allowed to eat the fruit from any tree in the garden, except the tree in the middle of the garden. Yahweh said, You must never eat it or touch it. If you do, you will die. Huh. <laughs> um, 
And so the snake responds to the woman saying, you certainly won't die, the snake told the woman. Yahweh knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like Yahweh, knowing good and evil. So this is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Before they ate the fruit, Adam and Eve were able to participate in conversations, obviously, but didn't have even the self-awareness to notice they were naked. So Eve responds this way. She's, or she does this. The woman saw that the tree had fruit that was good to eat, nice to look at, and desirable for making someone wise. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Very good. So now Adam and Eve, then their eyes were opened, and they both realized that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made clothes for themselves. Other words were used for this type of experience. They became self-aware, conscious, awake, or enlightened. I know some Christians don't like that last one, enlightened, but that, that is what it is, a synonym. All right, so let's move on now. That's all happened. And so now we have this interaction with Adam and Eve and Yahweh. Adam and Eve, in the cool of the evening, the man and his wife heard Yahweh walking around in the garden, so they hid from Yahweh among the trees in the garden. Well, wait, how can you hide from a non-physical God? And so here you can see my study called Yahweh, the physical God. All right? Yahweh responds. Yahweh called to the man and asked him, Where are you? Because they're hiding, right? <laughs> so was Yahweh not all-knowing? How did he not know where they were if he is God? Now, I know. I've <laughs> been a Christian all my life, so I, I understand what's going through the Christian's mind. It's like, no, no, Israel, you stupid person. Don't you understand that you know God is just saying this to kind of draw them out and get them to talk? And, uh, the text doesn't say that. So be careful with those metaphors that you're layering over the text to understand it because of the way you've been taught this story. Resist the metaphor. Peel the metaphors away and just let the text speak for itself. Really, really important. Okay? So Adam answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. So Yahweh was making sound walking around. Yahweh is a physical being. And you really need to look at my study on that. It's really cool. Um, Yahweh then asked two questions. Now, when you hear a sermon on the Garden of Eden, they always skip straight to the second question and completely omit the first question. But the first question is always the most important question. So, the first question was, who told you that you were naked? Who told you? Who told you you were naked? What? Wait, hang on a second. Who told you you were naked? You know, we could spend a ton of time on these two questions alone, but the implications of the first question, usually omitted or skipped over in any Bible study, cannot be ignored. And here's why. It means self-awareness can come from being told things, right? Hopefully, <laughs> that's happening right now. Hopefully, this study is opening your eyes. Who could have told them they were naked, right? Who else was there to have been able to tell them? If the snake was the only other being there, the question would be moot. But well, you don't have to ask if the snake's the only one there. So according to Christianity, right, there's only... Five people that exist right now. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and Adam and Eve. Now some will say, well, no, Jesus didn't come until to, to, to later on. No. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Nothing that was made was not made through him. He is the creator of all things, right? That's what John tells us. 
So there's very, very few. There's some interesting religions and sects out there, and most Christians aren't aware, you know, of of theology to this level, this detail. But it's completely accepted across the bulk of of Christendom that Yeshua existed at, long before the Garden of Eden. Right? Did Yahweh think Yeshua or the Holy Spirit, the other members of the Christian Trinity, may have told Adam and Eve they were naked? Well, who else could have told them? Why was Yahweh's first assumption that someone had told them rather than they so, so rather than they had eaten the fruit, right? So his first assumption wasn't, oh my God, you ate the fruit. No, it was like, who told you you were naked? Well, that's, that's interesting, you see. And see, I look at the text the way I read it, and I just go like, well, wait a minute, there's <laughs> something going on here. <laughs> Why is no one talking about this? <laughs> it seems that there were several individuals he suspected may have told them. Did Yahweh have many enemies? Not just the snake? Who, who could have interacted here, right? So we go back here to the second question, which was, did you eat fruit from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? And then we get the response of Adam. And the man answered, the woman, the one you gave me, <laughs> gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. So Adam passes the buck to Eve. Yahweh then responds. Then Yahweh asked the woman, what have you done? <laughs> Yahweh is genuinely shocked. Not the response we'd expect from an all-knowing God. Hmm. Eve responds, The snake deceived me, and I ate. The woman answered, passing the buck to the snake. All right, so now, Yahweh begins to curse all three of them, right? He curses the snake. So Yahweh said to the snake, Because you have done this, you are cursed. I will make you and the woman hostile toward each other. I will make your descendants and her descendants hostile toward each other. Now, there's something very interesting here. I love when I was putting this study together a long time ago, one of my, my very good friends, um, Jonathan Martin, has says, hey, what about the descendants? And I'm like, wait, what? And, and I didn't even notice, and he, he noticed here. Um, great, great things like this. Who are the snake's descendants, Right. I will make you and the woman hostile toward each other. I will make your, talking to the snake here, I will make your descendants, the snake's descendants? The snake's descendants? What are you talking about? Isn't he a fallen angel? Angels can't reproduce. Like, what, what is this? Apparently, they can. Because here is Yahweh cursing uh, the snake's descendants. I will make your descendants and her descendant hostile toward each other. Wow. Who are the snake's descendants? Does Satan have descendants? Not according to Roman universalism or Christianity, he doesn't. So how does that make any sense? Then Yahweh curses Eve. He said to the woman, I will increase your pain and your labor when you give birth to children. You will long for your husband, and he will rule you. Then he curses Adam. And he said to the man, You listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree, although I commanded you, you must never eat its fruit. The ground is cursed because of you. Through hard work you will eat food that comes from it every day of your life. The ground will grow thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat wild plants. By the sweat of your brow... You will produce food to eat until you return to the ground, because you are taken from it. You are dust, and you will return to dust. Right? So Adam can no longer eat from the fruit in the garden. Instead, he has to eat from wild plants outside the garden. Now, that's all very, very interesting. But let's, let's take a look at this. This is what happens next. Yahweh says to some others that Roman Universalists speculate is the Trinity, but it doesn't say that. All right? 
Again, be careful of applying metaphor. Oh, but Israel, you're so silly. You don't know that it's talking about the Trinity. No, I, I know the arguments inside and out, but it doesn't say that. All right? So, tradition might tell you that, but the text does not. And I love the text. I just want to know what the text says. And it's not that we can't go beyond the text, but it does mean that we try to read the text faithfully and not add in our own interpretations and metaphors to try to make sense of something. All right? So, Yahweh says this, The man has become like one of us, since he knows good and evil. He must not reach out and take from the fruit of the tree of life and eat. Then he would live forever. So it's crucial to realize something here. The snake didn't lie to Eve. Now, Eve said, well, the snake deceived me. The snake said they would become like Yahweh, and Yahweh then admits that very thing has occurred. So, if the snake lied, then Yahweh's lying here. Well, Yahweh's not lying here. He's just recounting what happened, the same as we just read in the story. Right? So then, Yahweh removes Adam and Eve from the garden. So Yahweh sent the man out of the Garden of Eden to farm the ground from which the man had been formed. And he sent the man out, or after he sent the man out, Yahweh placed angels and a flaming sword that turned in all directions east of the Garden of Eden. He placed them there to guard the way to the Tree of Life. The only reason Adam and Eve died was because Yahweh deprived them of the fruit of the Tree of Life which they previously had access to. And that is explicit in the text. Eating the fruit did not kill them as Yahweh told them it would. Rather, he killed them through his actions. Now, remember I said there's going to be some parts where you're like, wait a minute. This is what the text says. All right? So just hold on. Things will make a lot more sense as things start to click together. Right? That's what happened in the Garden of Eden story, but the story doesn't end there. So I've added a lot to this. I should probably just delete this. Yeah. I'll leave it here for now. The story starts in the beginning of Genesis, the very first book in the Bible, but it ends in another garden within a city at the end of the last book of the Bible, Revelation. So we are living between the gardens, between the trees. What happens next? Act 5. Yeshua. Yeshua comes into the picture. We read this before. Then the angel showed me the river, of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. This is Revelation 22. So, as we get deeper and deeper into the story, hopefully you're starting to see, well, wait a minute, this is not exactly how I was, uh, how I remembered the story. Probably not. And so, you know, over the next few days, I want you to go through all this material. I'll be making this mind map available to you, and you'll be able to go through it all, and take notes and look at the text and say, no, he must be making a mistake. Well, I mean, let me know. If you think I'm making a mistake, that's fine. Um, But what you're going to start to see is that there's something else going on here in this big story. There's something else going on here. So, next. What really happened in the garden? That was embarrassing. (laughs) All right. What really happened in the garden? Spilling coffee all over myself. Trying to gulp it down. That's why. All right. 
So here we just kind of let the the cat out of the bag. It's time to start really devouring the story and seeing what's going on, right? Cursed and restored. Let's break this story down into parts and see what happened here. So, pre-snake, man is in the garden. He has no self-awareness. Yahweh didn't want Adam and Eve to be able to recognize good from evil, unlike Yahweh who could. They had access to all of the trees except the tree of good and evil. They had biological immortality. And there was no curse. Right? That was pre-snake. Then the snake comes along. And things change. So now, post-snake, man is still in the garden for now. Has self-awareness. Eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, has access to all the fruit in the garden, for now, has biological immortality, for now, and no curse, for now. This is the state the snake created for humankind. Right? In the garden, self-awareness, access to all of the fruit of the garden, biological immortality, no curse. Well, then Yahweh comes along. Yahweh curses mankind and their relationship with the snake. Man is now outside of the garden. They still have self-awareness, couldn't be undone. But they have no access to any of the fruit. And they have no biological immortality. Right? Thankfully, consciousness can be told. Who told you you are naked? Right? So it's transferable person to person. Who told you you were naked? And that's what happens today when we educate each other, like we're doing right now. But what happens when Yeshua, in Revelation 22, restores everything? Man is in the garden. He has self-awareness. He has access to all the fruit in the garden. He has biological immortality. And there is no curse. Do you see something interesting here? The exact precise state that Yeshua restores humankind to here at the very end, after he has defeated Satan, after everything is done, the very identical state that Yeshua restores us to is the exact same state, the snake created for us in the garden originally what's going on how was this possible the exact same condition the snake created for mankind is the exact same condition Yeshua creates <clears throat> for us in the garden at the end. How is that possible? Summary. What the snake wanted for man. Free access to the fruit of all the trees and to live forever. What Yahweh did to us, cursed us to die by cutting off access to the fruit of the trees. What Yeshua then restores to us, free access to the fruit of all the trees and to live forever. How interesting. Why have you never been shown this before? So this is the theological dilemma. If the snake in the garden is Satan, one is forced to explain why Yeshua in Revelation 22 is restoring mankind back to the state that Satan wanted for them in the garden. And why the text calls this a restoration. So in Acts 3, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke. The only previous state that Yeshua is restoring 
is the one the snake created before Yahweh cursed them. This is an obvious theological dilemma that you've never been taught, because it's immediately obvious that the snake simply can't be Satan, and the entire Christian narrative will collapse at its foundation of original sin, and the snake being Satan evaporates. The snake is not Satan. Yeshua is not restoring mankind back to the very state Satan wanted for them. He's doing quite the reverse. Reframing the context. Christianity says we have God in the garden, God the creator of mankind, and the snake is Satan, a fallen angel. But the Bible actually shows that Yahweh was the ruler of the Garden of Eden, the God of this world, according to the entirety of Torah, but not the God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the God of this world has veiled the eyes of the unbeliever. The God of this world. Now you say, well, the God of this world is talking about Satan. Yes. (laughs) Yes, it is. (laughs) And the snake is Yeshua the creator of mankind, who created the desired state for mankind that Yahweh then destroys and Yeshua then restores us to that state again in Revelation 22. Now, at this moment, some of you are like, wait, oh my, oh, I don't know about this. That's a lot to take in. That's a lot to handle. Oh, I know. But we're going to go even deeper into the story And we're going to start to put more and more dots, connect more and more dots together. And you're going to see very clearly, there's nowhere in the text, except for a drunkard Paul, we'll get to that. (laughs) There's nowhere in the text that identifies the snake as Satan. But Yeshua identifies himself as the snake. And we'll see that in just a second. And then this Yahweh guy, let's take a look at him. Let's take a real good look at Yahweh. Remember, Yahweh wasn't there in the beginning. Well, he was, but he wasn't running the show, so it didn't use his name. It used Elohim. The same word translated here and correctly in Psalm 82 as the divine counsel. All right? The divine counsel. So there's a lot more going on in your Bible than you've ever seen before, but we read like 1% of it or less. When you start to read all of it and connect the dots as you become more and more familiar with it, you start to find things like this and go, wait a minute. The Bible doesn't support a monotheistic God. The Bible talks about gods all over the place, actually. So Yahweh comes in from Genesis 2.4. Now we know why, but let's continue. I want to get ahead of myself here. Identifying Yahweh and the snake. Now, I can't see any of your comments. Boy, I hope you've, uh, you've left a whole bunch of comments. Um, I'll have to go back over them later. Um, I swiped them aside, otherwise I'd never be able to stay on track with everything. So we're going to go through all of this. There's a lot here. And we're going to go really in depth. So when you, when you hear what I just presented, and if you haven't heard it before, you're like, wait, that's just, whoa, this is like, wow. There's got to be more to it than that. Yes, there is. And we're going to look at it now. There's so much that supports all of this, including just the simple, plain reading of the text. So let's start off with this restoration by Yeshua. Right? So this is really important. You understand what Yeshua is doing at the end. Right? Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city, and on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Can I my scroll back? Thank you. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Revelation 22. So when Revelation 22 is brought into view, the identity of the snake starts to become obvious. The snake is Yeshua, the creator of mankind. Bronze serpent. So here is this uh, incident that happened in the Old Testament, right? 
happened over in Numbers 21. Then Yahweh sent fiery serpents among the people. Remember, he was going to set the snake against the people. Yeah. So Yahweh sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many of Israel died. And the people came to Moses. That, that's the correct word, buddy. <laughs> Do I have to teach you to learn the word too? Really? Fascinating. Um, uh, and the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against Yahweh and against you, Moses. Pray to Yahweh that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and Yahweh said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. And this is Numbers 21. And all scholars agree this bronze serpent was a representation of Yeshua. And Yeshua made that clear himself. All right? So, Yeshua identifies as the bronze serpent. This is John 3, um, verse 14 and 15. So, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... What am I doing? So must the Son of Man be lifted up so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Yeshua. All right? So Yeshua is the serpent and he freely identifies with the serpent. Now, what's interesting is that when we go back and we look at these ancient uh, stories and mythologies from you know, going back many thousands of years from all around the world, the creator is often personified as a snake. Isn't that interesting? And so you'll see this in all kinds of imagery from the ancient past representing the snake. The snake wasn't a bad omen at all. It was a good omen. It was the creator of man. Roman universalism or Christianity teaches that the Yahweh of the Old Testament is the father of Yeshua, the father of the Trinity. The introduction of Yahweh only after the creation of man had taken place by the Elohim and introduced with a revised creation story. You can see that in your Bible. The, the creation story restarts from chapter 2, verse 4, um, when, when we first hear about Yahweh. Um, and introduced with a revised creation story, suggests something else is going on. Who's the new guy? Right? So in Genesis 1, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, all the way through to chapter 2, verse 3, the word used for God is Elohim. Right? What does Elohim mean? Well, it's translated in Psalm 82. It could be translated God or gods. Um, and it's, it calls it it calls the Elohim the divine council, hmm. the divine council. So um, you've got this divine council. Now it makes sense if it's a plural word. See, let's revisit Genesis one twenty six. Um, then God said, "Let us make man in our image, in our likeness." Okay, but that's not grammatically correct at all. And Hebrews. You know, it's, it's not that ancient of a language. I mean, it's, it, it, it has proper grammar. So it's, it doesn't make sense. So we're going, um, then God, singular, said, let us, plural, make man in our, plural, image, in our, plural, likeness. Wait, so you've got a singular followed by three plurals. What's going on? That doesn't make any sense, and it doesn't. And that's because that's not correct. Well, let's translate it correctly, that word Elohim instead of God, as the gods, or the divine council. Then the gods, the divine council, said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Plural, 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 plural. Now it makes proper grammatical sense, right? Why is Yahweh so different to Yeshua and the way Yeshua constantly describes his father in the Gospels? 
Why does Yahweh murder millions upon millions of humans only to have his supposed son, Yeshua, come and die for all humanity? He's killing them. He's killing them on absolute en masse. Millions upon millions upon millions of them. It's all in the text. And then his son Yeshua comes and dies for all of humanity? Like, what's, what, what happened there? Where's, where's the missing context? That's a little bit strange. Most Christians have great difficulty reconciling Yahweh of the Old Testament with Yeshua of the New Testament. And what you'll learn here today will finally make sense of their stark differences by re-identifying the snake and Yahweh. So what did Jesus say about his father? He said, I speak as the father taught me. He said, I always do what pleases him. He said, my father who gave them to me is greater than everyone else. He says, I and the father are one. Doesn't sound like he's getting his marching orders from Yahweh. What does Jesus say about the God or the father of the Jews? And here is where it starts to get really interesting, right? What he says is that their father is not his father. Here in John 8, 41, you're doing what your father does. And they respond to him, we're not illegitimate children, because he was illegitimate, right? They, everyone knew the story, Mary and getting pregnant and all that kind of thing, right? And so they said, we're not illegitimate children like you. God is our only father. Okay. And so then Yeshua replies and says, if God were your father, you would love me. After all, I'm here and I came from God. God sent me. Okay, so Yeshua is making it absolutely crystal clear. Your father, not my father. Your father, not my father. Okay, who is their father? God is our only father. Who is their God? Yahweh. Yahweh is their only God. Now, if they were meaning anybody else, it would have been blasphemy. They would have immediately been stoned to death on the spot by everybody. There's, there's no, again, the Roman metaphor police want to come in and, and, and say, oh, no, 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 no. Believe what we have to say about it instead. Well, generally, they just avoid this. Generally, you don't find people teaching on John 8 because of the difficulty of these texts. But let's continue to John 8, 44. And this is kind of the smoking gun of the entire biblical text. Yeshua says, you came or you come from your father, the devil. And you desire to do what your father wants you to do. The devil was a murderer from the beginning. From the beginning? Bereshit. Genesis. Beginning. That's what Genesis means, right? Beginnings. From the beginning. From the Genesis. The devil was a murderer from Genesis. He has never been truthful. He doesn't know what the truth is. Whenever he tells a lie, he's doing what comes naturally to him. He's a liar and the father of lies. So, you know, again, Christianity wants to come along and put all this metaphor in here. Oh, Israel, you ignorant person. He's talking about Satan. Yes, he is. He most certainly is. The problem is that Satan's not who you think he is. In John 8, 54, 55, my father is the one who gives me glory and you say that he is your God. Yet you haven't known him. My father is the one who gives me glory, and you say that he is your God. Yet you haven't known him. Uh uh. Uh uh. These people were following Yahweh's law to the letter. Right? To the letter. I mean, Yeshua made a point about it. Unless your faith is. Even more rigorous than that of the Pharisees, you shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Who then can enter the kingdom of heaven? Um, so you know, these were really strict religious people that were following Torah unbelievably. 
So, what does Yahweh say about his son? Yahweh, right? What does Yahweh say about his son? If Yeshua is Yahweh's son, as Christianity teaches, we should find just you know an abundance of examples of Yahweh talking about his son. He loves his son, right? The father of the son. I mean, they're like this. They're tight, man. So of course, when we when we encounter Yahweh in the Old Testament, we're going to hear him talking and describing his son, whom he loves so very, very much, right? What does Yahweh say about his son? Nothing. At no point in the entirety of the Bible does Yahweh ever even mention having a son. Why? What? <laughs> just, just stew on that for a second. What? How is what? No, no, no. You must be wrong. Never, not one single point. Not once. Never. Never. Not one single time. What doesn't Jesus say about his father? He talks about his father constantly, yet not once identifies his father as Yahweh. Not in any way, shape, or form. Talks about his father all the freaking time. Never connects him with Yahweh. Not once. Yahweh of the Old Testament never even mentions having a son. Yeshua of the New Testament never ever, in the constant talking about his own father, connects him with Yahweh of the Old Testament. In fact, he calls the God of the Old Testament a devil, a murderer from the Genesis. So here's just a couple of contrasts between Yahweh and, and, uh, and, uh, and Yeshua. Um, I don't know why is it Jesus' father. That's, that's not correct. Let me, let me fix that now. Uh, Yahweh never healed anyone, right? So the Jews began to persecute Jesus because he kept healing people on the day of worship. And Jesus replied to them, My father is working right now, and so am I. John 5, 16. Right? Um, yeah, oh, sorry, that was... <laughs> okay, that, I'll, I'll revert that. That was actually correct. Yahweh was seen. Jesus' father has not been seen, right? So here in Exodus... 33, and there's multiple, I've got a whole study on this, right, um, uh, called uh, Yahweh the Physical God. Uh, the Lord would speak to Moses personally as a man speaks to his friend, right? There's multiple, multiple, multiple occurrences. He spoke to uh, David, he spoke to Samuel, he spoke to uh, Moses, he spoke to uh, Moses' chief guy, uh, face to face, sat down at a table together and had a conversation one-on-one, -on -one, right? The Lord would speak to Moses personally as a man speaks to his friend. But in, in John 1, it says, no one has ever seen God, right? God's only son, the one who is closest to the Father's heart, has made him known. Now, you know what? I should actually, for context, add in, I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to switch over to my Bible app here for a second, because there's actually uh, a little more there that I want to add, right? Um. Mm -mm -mm. because you see here let's just I'm just going to recopy and paste this in here right because context as we talked about before is really important well John sets the context for the law was given through Moses so we're, we're talking about Moses Moses is the context for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Yeshua. Different translation, I must have pasted in here. Okay? So the context is like, oh, but I think you're taking that out of context. No, I'm not. John set the context. 
right? So here, the Lord would speak to Moses personally as a man speaks to his friend. And then John says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. Wait, what? Well, these are in, these are in contradiction with each other. No, they're not. Because they're not the same person. The father of Yeshua is not Yahweh. The father of Yeshua is not Yahweh, right? And there's many more examples. I just picked a few there. So, the coming unveiling of Satan. Many Christians think all knowledge of God has been achieved and there is nothing new to discover in the text. But the Bible itself contradicts this belief. Right? The text tells us an unveiling will take place with new information that will reveal who Satan is. Perhaps that time is now. Today. So, this is from... 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Now, we know a lot just from that passage, right? It's obviously talking about the abomination of desolation. We know that because it says here, the son of destruction, right? Um, We know that it's talking about the beast of revelation who opposes and exalts himself against everything, every so-called God or object of worship or or other translations say everything that is holy, right? Um, we, We know it's the abomination of desolation because it says, so he takes his seat in the temple of God, Right? We know it's the beast because it's proclaiming himself to be God. So, so what we're, we're, we're learning here from, from um, Paul is that um, this is from Paul, Timothy, and, and Silas, I believe, this letter to the Thessalonians. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to, together with him, let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts us. So, so New information is going to come, and you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. In other words, Paul is saying it's not revealed yet. Don't know. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way, and then the lawless one will be revealed. Right? So Christians kind of have this attitude, well, there's nothing new. It's like, you know, they, they, they quote Solomon, one of the most misquoted texts in, in, in the world. You know, there is nothing new under the sun. So, you know, you, you speak something new and immediately the Christian wants to go, false doctrine, heresy. Wait, wait. We were told that new information about the identification of Satan will come. When will it come? Right before the return of Messiah. Well, how do you know that? Because we see here in the context of what this is talking about, this act here, this is all what Yeshua is talking about in Revelation 13. This is immediately before the return of Messiah. So, immediately before the return of Messiah, new information is going to come to light that has been a mystery until now that is going to reveal who the man of lawlessness really is. Oh, let's continue. Here in 2 Corinthians 4, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world... Now, look, if you were to... This is Paul writing this. So if, if you were to ask this Pharisee of the Pharisees, you know, forget that... Well, let me ask just you, if you're a Christian, if we were to just remove... 2 Corinthians 4 from the Bible for a moment, right? Just as a mental exercise, okay? So we just, we'll just erase this, this one scripture just for a moment. So you no longer have this automatic connection that the God of this world is Satan because all Christians have this, this immediate metaphorical context. Oh, the God of this world, Satan. Okay, forget that context. If I was just to ask you without this text having given you any context whatsoever and just said, according to the Bible, who is the God of this world? What would your answer be? Yahweh, what are you talking about? Yahweh. Right, Yahweh is the God of this world, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. But 
<laughs> the scripture does exist in the Bible, and it says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Do you see what Paul is saying? Yahweh is not God. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the good news of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Right? So new information is coming that will expose Satan. It's a mystery. He was already at work, and he will sit in the temple as God. He will sit in the temple as God. Right? Boy, the temperature is dropping outside. Let me just get my fan totally off here. Didn't need AC today. I think the, uh, I think the weather service is lying to us. They're telling us that we've got all these incredibly unseasonally hot days, and it's like, <laughs> are you kidding me? And, you know, I'm in Boulder, Colorado, so nowhere is literally like five miles away as the crow flies. It's, it's very, very close to here. And uh, that's the, the national weather service for the whole country. It's like considered the weather service of the whole world right here on my doorstep, and they, they can't get the local forecast right at all. Isn't it interesting that Yeshua had to die? Hang on, sorry, why don't we, let's go back here. So clues, let's look at some clues. Isn't it interesting that Yeshua had to die to destroy Satan's works, and at the same time fulfilled, completed the law? Huh? What does Satan have to do with Yahweh's law? What? Why, why are the two so, so, so connected? Right? Yeshua is going to destroy Satan himself. So isn't it odd that the Bible hardly even mentions Satan? Right? So we have the temptation in the wilderness. Right? And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whom I will. If you, then, will worship me, it will be all yours. Hmm. Interesting. Right? So we have this, this picture of, of Satan here, and now we have this one here in Job chapter 1. Now there was a day when the sons of God, plural, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the, on the earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Now, uh, I'm working on this passage and probably it's going to take me a year before I'm ready to do a study on it. But... This is, uh, let's, let's bring up my Bible software again. I want to show you something. So when, uh, when this incident occurs here um, in Job, we're in Job chapter 1. And so you can see here, verse 7, Then the Lord said to Satan, <clears throat> From where have you come? And Satan answered, right? Um, and then all of a sudden, verse 8, and the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Well, I don't know about you, but when I read the text, I'm always very curious about what I'm reading. And I, I read that and I go, wait, it's just this massive sudden switch. Like there's a whole bunch of missing context here. Verse 7 and verse 8 don't flow at all, right? It's like there's an entire conversation or at least a, a large part of a conversation that's just completely deleted from the text perhaps there's something else going on here that triggered the lord the father of yeshua in this case to say to satan have you considered my servant job for for what 
So there's a whole lot of missing context. This is very important. Um, but I can't, I can't really teach on it because I don't have a whole lot more to share. But there's something else going on here, right? The more you read the text, the more you, you bump into things like this. You don't just whiz past it. You go, wait, 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 what? Because you see, you can't just read the Bible once or twice, right? You've got to keep reading it. Like, um, I, like I have a neck speaker and I put this on my neck and, uh, and I just listen to the Bible all day long, right? And I used to do it with headphones and I got all kinds of headphones to do that with. And, um, I got wonderful, uh, Sennheiser headphones that are old Sennheiser wireless cans, um, that are super comfortable. You can wear all day long. And all my life I've devoured the text and, you know, I mean, it's kind of funny to say that, you know, or, or do you know the text a little bit? I mean, you know, it's like that saying, the more you know, the more you know you don't know, right? And, and it's not being falsely humble. Um, I love the text. I love the text like crazy. I'm so completely immersed in it all the time. But to be completely honest, I don't know it very well at all. And I'm not being falsely humble in saying that. I'm not, oh, you're sure you don't. No, no, no. I'm like, like I learn so much every day when I listen or read the text so much every single last day that I listen to, you know, more than 20 minutes of the text, I learn something and I'm deadly serious and not just like a little tiny thing. You've got to become, and I know not all of you will, and that's fine because you've got lives and, but with some of you, you need to become scholars, students of the text and you need to devour it and you need to become intimately familiar with it. Because there's so much here, and there is absolutely no end to what you will pull out of the text, right? Uh, there's just no end whatsoever. We'll just keep going over and over. This is so much more and more and more and more. There's absolutely no end to it. Now, these people that, you know, you usually, you know, atheists where they want to sky, I read the Bible, it's a lot of nonsense. Okay, you read the Bible once. Really? <laughs> Dude, I've read it hundreds of times. And every time I, I read it or listen to it, I am, oh, it's tetrachrome. It's raining outside. Um, every time I'm listening to it, I realize how little I know about it. I mean, just, you know, really, seriously. So, uh, so there's something going on here between verses 7 and 8. Let's get back to it. Um. So that's that's so Satan is mentioned there, right? And then there's here in First Peter five, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Listen, your adversary. What does Satan mean? The adversary, your adversary, Satan, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Right, that's what he said, right? From going to and fro on the earth and walking up and down on it, right? And then and that passage in First Peter continues and says, After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Again, going back to Revelation 22, right? Steal, kill, and destroy. So this is what Yeshua himself said in John 10, 8. All, my emphasis there, obviously, all who came before I did were thieves or robbers. All. All. All is pretty all-encompassing, right? Yahweh is included in all. All who came before me, all who came before I did were thieves or robbers. Right? Who came before Yeshua? Yahweh. And then two verses later, a thief, talking about all who came before I did with thieves or robbers, a thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Which is exactly what Yahweh did in the garden, exactly what Yahweh did when he took the children of, um, of, of the Lord out of Egypt. Right. So who is Yahweh? So now we're really letting the cat out of the bag. So let's Get into it. Yahweh is the adversary. Yahweh is Satan. And Roman universalism has flipped the script on us and tried to tell us that Yahweh is God, the father of Yeshua, 
but he's not. He's the one Yeshua came to complete his law that he had bound us in, right? And at the same time, destroyed the works of the enemy. Yahweh's the adversary. And the text is crystal clear on this. And you're going to see, I know some of you are just like, no, 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 I can't do that. No, 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 I can't. Just wait. The text is replete with examples proving this. This is not speculation. Yahweh doesn't appear until Genesis 2-4, where the creation story is retold with Yahweh as God instead of the Elohim. Genesis 1 through 2-3 is one creation story, then another begins in Genesis 2-4, with Yahweh retelling the story from his perspective. We know what happened with the change from the Elohim to Yahweh, but it isn't part of the narrative Roman Universalism tells us. Yeshua was originally the God of this world. He created everything. Yahweh took over at Genesis 2-4 and became the God of this world from Yeshua. That's why the name of the God changes to Yahweh. Now we talk about this in other talks, so we won't go into that in depth, but we will cover it a little. He is the God of this world, also known as Satan, the adversary, the devil, and the beast in Revelation 13. And the text makes this crystal clear, as you're about to see. Now, if you just tuned in, you're going to be like, wait, what the heck? Yeah, just wait. So, here Yeshua describes the beast in Revelation 13, right? He says, And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth. So, Yeshua is saying that the beast of Revelation, right? There's the first and the second beast. He says the beast was like, well, first of all, he's a beast. So we've got four descriptive words, right? Beast, leopard, bear, lion. Yeshua, this is Yeshua's revelation to John on the island of Patmos. He's giving him a clear description of who the beast is. The beast is like, a, it's a beast, like a leopard, a bear, and a lion. A beast, like a leopard, a bear, and a lion. Interesting. Revelation 13, right? Let's see how Yahweh describes himself in Hosea 13, right? <clears throat> so this is Hosea 13. But I am the Lord your God from the land of Egypt. You know no God but me, and besides me there is no Savior. Now wait a minute, what? So straight up, Yahweh calls himself the only Savior. Besides me, there is no Savior. Some translations will say, you know, there, beside me, there is no, uh, that, that, he is, that I am the only Savior, right? But Yeshua is the Savior of mankind. But, but Yahweh is saying he's the only Savior. Well, that's a lie. Then he continues. So I am to them like a lion, a lion, a leopard a bear, and a beast. So I am to them like a lion, like a leopard. I will lurk beside the way. I will fall upon them like a bear robbed of her cubs. I will tear open their breasts, and there I will devour them like a lion, as a wild beast would rip them open. Yahweh describes himself the exact same way Yeshua describes the beast. Oh, it gets better. This is crystal clear. This is just, this is, this is a smoking gun. But there's more, there's more, and we keep finding more because, you know, when, when you've never entertained these ideas before, and I found this, uh, almost two years ago and it took me 19 months, actually almost three years ago, sorry. And it took me 19 months to even open my mouth and start talking about this, that Yahweh was Satan because I'm telling, I mean, you know, it brands me forever. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been in ministry all my life. And, and now I'm saying this, which is complete heresy to Christianity. So I was very careful. But as we've talked about this, and more and more people are reading through the text, I mean, I'm getting messages every single day. We have a private group for some of us, and we have one, the, the longest running thread is, you know, paste here any text that now make more sense to you from this new context. 
and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And we keep getting more and more evidence from the text alone that it's absolutely crystal clear. Yahweh is the devil. Yahweh is the Satan. And so here we have in Revelation 13 and in Hosea 13 this crystal clear description that Yeshua gives of the beast in Revelation. And we have Yahweh describing himself the exact same way in Hosea. And boy, oh boy, just read the rest of Hosea and see what Yahweh continues to say to Israel. There's no doubt he's the beast. How has Christianity missed this for 2,000 years? Not by accident, but by design. So we go back to John 8, 44, right? You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He, the devil, was a murderer from Genesis, the beginning, and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies, right? So Christians avoid this text like the plague, or they want to say, well, it's Satan. They say it's talking about Satan. Yes. Yes, it is. (laughs) It's also talking about Yahweh who is Satan. Now, let's, let's look at another core piece of evidence where the Bible explicitly calls Yahweh Satan. I kid you not. Now you think, oh, it can't get any worse than that. Oh, but it does. The text explicitly calls Yahweh the adversary, Satan. The word Satan means the adversary. The first time the word Satan is used is in 2 Samuel 24, where a census is being taken. This story appears in two different books of the Bible, the exact identical story. You can compare them. There's there's no scholar disagree. I mean, it's it's almost word for word, except for one slight change. One calls the person telling David to do the census, Yahweh, and the other calls him Satan. I kid you not. So there's a story that's recorded twice in the Bible. I just said that. Okay. <laughs> the numbering of Israel. So here, 2 Samuel 24, again, the anger of the Lord, this word here, Yahweh, was kindled against, in fact, I'm just going to change that because that is the actual transliteration of the Hebrew word there, was kindled against Israel and he incited David against them saying, go number Israel and Judah. The same story in 1 Chronicles 21 says, then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. To number Israel, just like the beast in Revelation 13, is going to number us. Well, not me, and hopefully not you, but a lot of people, right? Because they're going to be branded with the mark of the beast. They're going to be numbered. This is a system that's been used throughout, throughout history. Marketplace, local deity, to go into the marketplace, you have to go visit the local deity first. There would be an attendant there. You pay him your fee. He, you burn some incense at the altar of this, this you know, statue, and the attendant will give you a stamp on your hand, and then you can go into the marketplace and buy and sell. This mark of the beast is a real physical. It's not 5G. It's not a microchip. It's not a vaccine. It's not your cell phone. It's a mark. It's going to be a real physical mark, and it's going to be right on your hand. If you're, you're an amputee, it's going to be on your forehead. Same thing Yahweh has the, the, the Jews doing with their tefillin, right? You've seen the Jews with these black leather straps, and they wrap this, this box on their, their arm and on their, their head. This is what Yahweh does, right? On your right hand or on your forehead. This is what they do. Now you can put tefillin on either side. So, This is what he's done in the past. This is what he's going to do again. This is who he is. Yahweh is Satan. And the Bible says so, right? Um, So he stole the Hebrews from Egypt, only became their God from Egypt, and says so, right, in Hosea 13 again, but I am the Lord your God from the land of Egypt. It's just right in the text. I am the Lord your God from the land of Egypt. Now, let's, because I'm all for 
total openness and transparency. Let's look at the only objection that I can find anywhere that contradicts any of this. But of course, when you look at the mass of all of the evidence we're accumulating, um, you start to realize, yeah, okay, there's a little bit to over overcome. This is the singular objection. Let's take a look at this. So this is in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3 where Paul says, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Wow. That's as close as you're going to find in the entire Bible that contradicts anything else that I'm saying here. Now, on its face, it's like, well, that's not much. It's like the serpent deceived Eve. Eve said that the serpent is, is like, you know, there's not, nothing really there. No, there's nothing there. So, he says he's about to speak foolishness, right? I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. So, he's about to speak like a fool, right? And then he says, I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Uh, no, Paul. You did not, and no, you won't. This is nonsense. This is foolishness, right? What he's saying here, these words, there's, there's, there's no such thing. None of this. Is, Paul doesn't have any role to play in, in, in the rest of, of church life. There's, there's, Paul isn't mentioned in, in Revelation. There's, there's no, this whole, I betroth you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. What? No. What, what is he talking about? It's just gibberish, actually. Right? It's just gibberish. Now, he's already saying he's going to talk like a fool, but, but this is just gibberish. Paul is repeating the tradition of the Jews, which came from Yahweh. And he's speaking casually, not setting forth doctrine. So I show it to you because I'm not worried about it. It's like there's nothing here. But I did have one person some weeks ago say, oh, no, there's this text where Paul... Look, okay, what does it say? First of all, he sounds like he's drunk. Oh, I'm serious. He sounds like he's drunk, right? He's not writing this. He's, he's having a scribe to write it down for him. I, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. None of that is happening. None of that is. There's, there's, no, there's, there's nothing else in the entire biblical text that, that relates to anything he is saying there. Paul has no role to play in any of any future events whatsoever. That is just folly, as he said. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. The idea of the snake being uh, you know, the enemy that, that deceived Eve is a common Jewish idea. And Paul is a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He knows the law inside out, back to front. All right? That's it. And you've got to overcome... All this, and, and we really just touching the surface. I mean, we, you know, we've already been here for over two hours. There is so much more. Now, as I started pre to present this, people started to, or two people said, well, you're a Martianite, and that's heresy. So who was Marshawn? Marshawn was one of the very early church fathers. He lived from 85 through 160 AD. He was born in Turkey, and he moved to Rome in the late 130s after being invited to join Roman universalism, Catholicism, and he became a bishop. He eventually was called a heretic by Rome and excommunicated. He published the very first canon of scripture before our biblical canon that we have today from Rome. So, uh, let's, uh, I, I pinched this from a, a Catholic website. Study of the Hebrew scriptures along with received writings circulating in the nascent church, the early church, led Marshawn to conclude that many of the teachings of Jesus were incompatible with the actions of Yahweh, well, as all modern Christians feel as well. He called him the belligerent God of the Hebrew Bible. Marshawn responded by developing a ditheistic system of belief around the year 144. This notion of two gods, a higher transcendent one and a lower world creator and ruler, allowed Marshawn to reconcile his perceived contradictions between Christian Old Covenant theology and the gospel message proclaimed by the New Testament. I wish Marshawn had access to the information that we have access today. He would have understand he would have understood 
that how right he was, how he, he kind of got it a little wrong by, by thinking of a dualistic system, but he was on the money. He was on the right path. Uh, well, I'll take you back to look at something in a second, but here's what a, a Catholic apologist website has to say. I, and I kind of, I kind of get the jollies about this, to be honest. Um, this is what they say about my Sean. As they arose in the very infancy of Christianity, this is talking about the beliefs of Mashon, um, and adopted from the beginning of a strong ecclesiastical organization parallel to that of the Catholic Church, they were perhaps the most dangerous foe Christianity has ever known. Boy, I, you know, <laughs> I, I could only hope that one day somebody writes that about me. <laughs> I just... Um, you know, I love the Lord, and what I hate and despise is people putting a millstone or a stumbling block before his children. Those people need a millstone tied around their neck and to be thrown into the deep ocean. Christianity has lied to us about the identity of the snake. It's lied to us about who Yahweh is. Mashon got it. But because Roman universalism was so powerful, they called him a heretic. They excommunicated him. After trying to change his mind for a long time, they invited him to come in. They invited him to Rome. He's very famous. All of his, all of his writings have been lost to history. They destroyed them all. They made sure they eradicated them all over time. I didn't find this information by finding out about Marchand and then going down a rabbit trail. Everything we've, we've looked at today, I found from completely separate uh, avenues, pathways. It was two people that criticized me, including this apologist that was going to expose me on his radio show uh, as being a Martianite, <laughs> oh, a Martian, um, that told me I didn't know about Martian. I'd never heard of him before. And so, I mean, I've been to seminary, but you don't, you don't learn everything. <laughs> There's a lot to learn. But when I suddenly discovered that one of the earliest, right, most of the early church fathers come from the second and third century. Um, here, here, this guy's really one of the earliest of the early church fathers. And when I found out that he saw Yahweh the same way I had discovered that Yahweh was from the text, I just, I mean, just like, come on. <laughs> That's very interesting, right? So, I'm not the only one that felt this way, but this has been lost to history, and it's time to spread the truth again about what Mashon saw and about what everyone can see when they look at these things and go, but the text is so plain here. Yes, it is. So, the culmination. We're about to, about to finish up. It's been a long day. Rome has invented fairy tales to fool humanity into worshipping Satan and turn Yeshua into Satan. Yeshua is coming for us. He finished the law. He's coming to finish off the lawgiver. He's going to restore us back to the garden with free access to the fruit of the tree of life. Eternal life isn't, as, as some say, that we're, I, need, I didn't write that very well, did I? Eternal life isn't as, as, oh no, I did. Okay, I just read it wrong. Eternal life isn't as some spirit. It's as a biologically immortal being living freely with Yeshua and his Father. Now, what did Marshon not see? Well, Marshon got this idea there must be a higher God and a lower God. Yes, he was right. And that's who we were looking at before. That's them here. So, we talk about these guys a lot in other talks, and we're not going to do, do it uh, very much right now, but uh, I recommend that you go to andersondiscoveries.com and go through the material there and you start to learn about these three people here. Three of them. The one on the left, the one on the right, and the one above the tree of life. This is the Father and the Son and Satan, Yahweh. Inlil Nunamnir, by his Sumerian name on the left, is the Satan. He is Yahweh. The dude on the right... Enki'ia is Yeshua, the creator of humankind. And we, as we saw those photos before, we see these guys all throughout history, all different cultures, all over the world. The real father of both of these guys 
is on the top, and his name is Anu, and we will see this winged disc everywhere. You'll see it in Egypt. You'll see it everywhere. So you say, oh, that's all mythology. Really? So these same symbols just carved by people into solid granite with high precision, you know, tools that had to at least have been made with diamond tip tools, high speed, uh, the ability to carve three dimensionally um, and all over the world, all these ancient cultures and they're all the same symbols. And it's all just mythology. Who built, who did this? How do you do this? You're going to like carve it with a piece of you know, stone. No, I mean, this is, this is, you know, seven, eight uh, on the Mohs hardness scale, um, you're going to have to have some really high-tech machinery to create an image like this from the ancient, ancient past. So these are some of the, the oldest, but not the oldest, but some of the oldest pictures we have. You are literally looking at Yahweh on the left. You're literally looking at an image, a, a real-life depiction of Yahweh, of Satan, of the devil, of the adversary. And on the right, you're literally looking at Yeshua, Jesus. So, Mashon got it kind of right. Yes, Anu is the God of all of us. And Yeshua is his son. Now you say, but no, John 3.16 says only begotten son. Yes, only begotten son. The only one that came as a man. But not the only son. One thing that the Mormons got right, though they got almost everything else wrong. So, Okay, that's who they are. So this isn't religion. This is science, you understand. And there's nothing wrong with that. But Jesus, Yeshua, is real. He's a real, bona fide, historical figure that we can look at back through the, the sands of time and are carving and go, are you serious? Yes, that is Jesus, period. End of story. That is, on the right-hand side there, is Jesus. Now, if you were to spin around and be a new here looking out, right? Yahweh, Satan, is on the right hand of the Father. And Yeshua is on the left hand of the Father. The right hand of the Father is the, the, the preeminent side, the ear. Well, what's going on there? Well, you know that the Christian tradition, even though it's not in the Bible, although it comes from Greek and Roman mythology, that Satan was the second most powerful in the kingdom, but he wanted it all for himself. So he tried to overthrow the kingdom and was cast down. Yes, right? And we get little scraps of that from the biblical text, but we get the majority of that story not from the biblical text. And most Christians don't realize because they just don't know that this actually isn't detailed in the Bible. But it comes from Greek and Roman mythology. Zeus and Jupiter. Zeus in um, Greek mythology and Jupiter in Roman mythology overthrew Anu or tried to. All right. And so when we look back at the ancient past, you say, oh, that's all extra biblical nonsense. Extra biblical nonsense. Dude, this is a primary source. Right? This this has got this text here is carved into solid granite. Do you understand? Like we don't have anything like this as the source for anything in the Bible. I love the Bible immensely, but we don't have a single primary source for a word in the Bible. Not one. Everything in the Bible is a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. Every last thing. Without exception. Not one exception. Right? Now that's unfortunate, but it is what it is. It doesn't mean it's bad. The atheist will say, oh, there's a load of nonsense. There. No, well, it's not because we can match it up with things like this that are primary sources. In other words, this isn't a copy of something. This is an original. Right? And we have originals of many clay tablets and, and other things that are written into solid stone all around the world. Right? So go to andersondiscoveries.com and work out the answer to the question and go through all of the material that's there and you'll start to see that these guys here really are Yahweh, Yeshua, and their father, who we know as Anu, A-N-U, God. That's the real God that's demonstrated in this winged disc symbol on top here. Standing before the tree of life. That is the whole central focus of the Bible. So, you know, I just want to know what's going on. 
when I came up with my two questions now about five years ago, who are we? What is the universe? I mean, it just, it opened my mind to so much more and I started connecting dots that I don't think anyone else has ever connected before. Hence why we're creating a nonprofit and we're very serious about all this. And we want to get this information out to everybody, especially Christians, right? Because the greatest deception of all is coming, where the beast, the abomination of desolation, Yahweh himself is going to appear in the newly rebuilt temple that's going to be rebuilt any moment now, right? We're waiting for a peace treaty with Israel. Um, They're going to get permission to rebuild the the temple. They're going to build the third Jewish temple. They're going to start animal sacrifices. They're going to do it for three and a half years, according to Daniel 7. And then they're going to stop. And then Yahweh himself, this dude on the left, is going to appear in the temple and proclaim himself God. And then he's going to have the second beast come along, which is kind of like father and son. And the problem is that most Christians don't know their Bible from a bar of soap. And they're going to fall for it. And they're going to think, this is Yahweh. And look, here's his son. And it says the son is going to brand us. So, oh, this must be the son branding us. Oh, this is great. And, uh, and who knows what, maybe, maybe Bibles will be outlawed and banned. Maybe it'll be contraband. It'll be illegal. But the greatest deception that's ever come upon humanity is at our doorstep. And we see it all unfolding in front of us. Right? The final battle over humanity is about to occur between these two guys. And I'm going to choose the one on the right. I'm going to choose Yeshua HaMashiach. And he has promised to give us access to the fruit of the tree of life so we can live with him forever. Amazing, right? History is telling us the same people are involved. Yeshua is one of them. Satan is one of them. That's a whole messed up sentence. Um, And there's so much more to learn. So go to andersondiscoveries.com and learn. So here's how you stay connected with everything that I'm doing. Uh, I'll leave that on the screen kind of like that. Just make that full screen. And thank you so much for your time today. I hope you've really learned something. Before you go, please give me a thumbs up. Um, That'll tell Facebook to share this with other people. Um, If you've got a comment, then uh, please leave a comment uh, before you go. I haven't been reading comments, and if I try to bring the comments up now, I won't be able to see them anyway because it doesn't show previous comments anymore like it used to on Facebook. Um, If you want to support me and get your name on the ticker there, thank you. Please do. Really appreciate it. Um, It's all my friends that enable me to do this. Uh, I study this full time. This is my job. And you can you can send me something through Cash App, Venmo, PayPal, and there's other options there if you go to my website, israelanderson.com slash support. We have a community app here. Um, you can download it on the app stores. Search for locals.com. There's a couple of apps called Locals. So search for locals.com specifically on the Android or the iOS app store. You'll find it. And then you need to search for Anderson Discoveries within the app. It's like a secret community. Um, and it's really cool. And there's some other ways to contact me there. Uh, make sure you're on the mailing list. Go to andersondiscoveries.com. You'll get a prompt there to sign up to the mailing list. Make sure you do that. Uh, I don't send emails out very often. If you want to get notifications of these studies, uh, I don't have it up there, but you can go to, let me add, add it here while we're, we're talking. Um, Go to free Bible audio book. Did I just do a space? <laughs> dot com. And you can download a free Bible audio book. The whole Bible, absolutely free, right? Um, and there, there's also a mailing list where you can get notified only just before these talks so you can come and tune in live. All right? Um, that's a brand new list that we just got started. So, hope you've really learned something valuable today. Uh, hope you've seen that we glorify Yeshua and we always will. Um, and he's coming soon. So, investigate this material and make sure you know whose side you're on because this really is about choosing a side a side of peace and love and, and humanity. Or a side of, of slavery and deception and darkness. 
and I would encourage you to choose the side of light. All right? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. And may he give you peace. Have a wonderful evening this Sunday. Take care. Bye-bye.